Welcome to the public program of But Ears Have No Lids, Maya Namir and Rudy Sella. My name is Renan Laruan, curator of the project and the public engagement and artistic formation coordinator of the Philippine Contemporary Art Network. By way of a preface, the ongoing physical screening of But Ears Have No Lids at the Vargas Museum is part of a year-long screening program on hearings. The series of online and offline presentations explores the nature and development of hearing in three amplitudes that call for the ears to pay attention. One, hearing as a field of being touch. Two, the documentary agency of hearing. And three, hearing's right of right or refusal to inform. The first volume of screenings cites the concept of extraterritoriality through the practice of Tel Aviv-based artist duo Mayan Amir and Ruti Sella. In their films, Amir and Sella examine the loss, migration, and representation of images in the lattice of legal, medical, and psychosocial conditions. This assemblage of the most minute idiosyncratic and provocative political facts nominates the values of artistic imagination and gesture in circulating attention. The works of Mayan Amir and Ruti Sella, now accessed in the Philippine context, motivates a syncopated look at the rhythms of the world and how that might commit the experience of touch, whispers, and murmur in today's political engagement. The public program of But Ears Have No Lids expounds these commitments in a month-long presentation of lectures and discussions with thinkers and artists who are invited to situate or locate extraterritoriality in their practices, to attach new terminologies or subjects in the current understanding of extraterritoriality, or to consider extraterritoriality as an additional reference to the existing architecture of attentions. The public program today opens with the artist talk with Mayan Amir and Ruti Sella. They will share the, inf the formation of extraterritoriality in their research and artistic output. The artists will highlight some of the urgent concerns for a shared discussion based on the film's screen, both online and at the museum. Then, documentarist Ajani Arumpak offers her contributions to the dynamics of an extraterritorial image in a response that foregrounds the status of the documentary image within political and misinformation programs. In the next weeks, new contributions from thinkers and practitioners from the region will join us. Presentations by Jakarta-based artists Erwan Amet and Tita Selena, legal scholar Gemma Fernandez, public health specialist Alberto Ong Jr., and art historian Patrick Flores will be uploaded every Saturday at 5 p.m. until April 9 on the official Vimeo account of the Philippine Contemporary Art Network. In this final session of But Ears Have No Lids public program, we turn to the cosmos of the Filipina modernist artist in Paris, Nena Sagil. In what may look like to be vicious circles in Sagil's abstraction, some characterizations of an extraterritorial life or subjectivity, migrant, exile, homeless, and so on, are replenished with new energies, obsessive, manic, explosive, or even ascetic. All these seem to traverse not only the circular and cyclical anymore, but perhaps also the cellular and the membranous in the continuous and simultaneous emptying out of the self and emptying out of the world. In this lecture, Nene Sagil, the itinerant in the attic, the extraterritorial self is an extraterritorial practice, 
constellative and archipelagic as art historian and curator Patrick Flores describes it. The figure of the artistic, in the senses of Sagal's plenitude, offers a conception of extraterritoriality beyond normative aspirations surrounding settlement and stability. Here, by dilating Sagal's veins without distilling her practice, this is perhaps an invitation to retrain our senses, memories, and physicalities in drawing and being drawn into circles. Now, we listen to Patrick Flores. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to... So the idea of extraterritoriality might converse well with the work of Nena Sagil, who in the course of her practice and in her own delicate but decisive way, moved away from the habits of place and found herself elsewhere, again to be rooted and at the same time remaining elusive. Territory for her, I think, was not origin or destination. It was something to be patiently traversed, passed through on her way to her attic in Paris, which she emptied out of the world so that she could fill it with the cosmos of her art and her spirit. Nena Sagil was born in 1914 and completed her fine arts education at the University of the Philippines in the 30s. In Philippine modern art history, she belonged to a coterie of artists who were exploring a language beyond post-impressionism moving towards what they called neorealism and then non-objective art. At this point in her practice, she was turning away from the realist and romantic traditions of the 19th century academy and engaged with early modernism and eventually late modernism. With a scholarship from the Walter Damroche organization in 1954, she studied at the Ecole des Arts Américains at the Palais du Fontainebleau in Paris one of her teachers thought that she was advanced in her talent. She later went on, she later went to the Académie de la Grande Chaumière where she was mentored by the surrealist Henri Goetz, originally an American who moved around the circles of Hans Artung, Raoul Ubach, and Maria Helena Vera da Silva. Sagil's first one-person exhibition in Paris was organized by Gallery Cruz in 1957, she also exhibited in the galleries of Suzanne de Conant, beginning in 1965 and in international exhibitions like the Bienal Hispano-Americana de Arte in 1954 in Havana, the Paris Biennale in 1961, and the Salon de l'Art Sacre et de Realité Spirituelle at the Musée de l'Art Moderne in Paris in 1965, the Seventh Salon International Paris Sud in Juvisy in 1966, among others. She died in Paris at the Hôpital Tonon in 1994. Just some images of the works of Nena before she moved on to uh, abstraction. So this is Nena uh, with uh, her sisters with five different costumes. Uh, Nena. Nena's work uh, called Vanity, so we see a bit of a shift from the, the rural countryside uh, uh, landscape to the urban, more cosmopolitan uh, milieu. And then, as I have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Nena moved from post-impressionism to realist, to neorealism, and on to non-objective art, just like. Uh, how Hernando Ocampo uh, navigated the phases of, of modernism. So like H.R. Ocampo, uh, uh, Nena also moves through these phases from uh, post-impressionism to uh, a modernism with uh, more sources, uh, specifically sources from the School of Paris and then non-objective art in in the 50s as uh, uh, 
as uh, embodied by the work animation number two, which was uh, nominated as uh, non-objective by uh, uh, commentators like uh, Magtanggol Asa, as you can see in this uh, particular uh, news clipping. These paintings are non-objective. The, and then so here we have uh, more full-blown, uh, more fully developed uh, abstract works of, of Nena in the 60s, 61 and 65. The uh, source of the non-objective uh, is a bit of um, a puzzle. Uh, it's not really well established where they got the term non-objective, but I suspect that the, it came from uh, Hilary Bay, also a, a woman of uh, broad sympathies. Uh, she was the advisor of Solomon Guggenheim, a painter and a believer of theosophy and also of uh, the ideas of Rudolf Steiner. Uh, uh, she was partly responsible in developing the precursor of the Guggenheim. Uh, uh, which was the uh, Museum of uh, Non-Objective Painting. The Museum of Non-Objective Painting. And here you see uh, paintings of, of Kandinsky who influenced uh, Nena Sagil as well. So this might have been the, the sources of the term non-objective as it uh, became rooted in, in the Philippines. And here you see the, uh, the image of Susan de Conant, who was a, uh, uh, the gallerist of, of Nena Sagil. And, uh, then, and I will explain later that uh, Susan de Conant uh, founded the uh, Cybernetic uh, Center of Art, which again is a uh, interesting entry point into the idea of the extraterritorial. In looking at Nena Sagil, I am building on the work of two Filipino critics, Leonidas Benesa and Emmanuel Torres, who wrote monographs on her in 1968 and 2003, respectively. When I was doing research in Paris two years ago, I was reflecting on possible methodologies on and entry points into the practice of Sagil. The initial difficulty had something to do with the fact that she was not very well known and that Philippine modern art as a field of study does not have specialists in Europe and North America. Secondly, art history and exhibition history tend to privilege the discourses of museums, institutions, and alternative or potentially avant-garde spaces and have only begun to consider and take interest in equally important initiations from, from or within the art market through which someone like Sagil partly gained presence in the Paris art scene. Thirdly, the position of Sagil being a woman migrant artist from the Philippines further rendered her invisible in a cosmopolis like Paris with the three categories of woman, migrant, and Philippines complicating her marginal status. That said, Paris liberated her from the patriarchies of, of Manila. These difficulties are for me generative because they do not only critique the apparatus of the art world and the techniques of art history, they also provide opportunities for us to reconstruct the entire technology of the discipline through the aesthetic proposition and the social context of the practice of an artist such as Sagil. In other words, the production of art and the circulation of artists inform the theorization of the history of art. In this regard, I identify some entry points or trajectories into Sagil as a way to make her part of the meshwork of artistic relations in Manila and Paris in her time. The method therefore is constellative, extraterritorial if you will, other than monographic, one that deepens the integrity of one artist as it simultaneously thickens the ecology of her affinities. Moreover, this method is also archipelagic working away from the sign of a formidable and hegemonic archive and venturing into islands or mangroves of references, citations, links, transmissions, channels, and so on. The first entry point is the internationalism being enhanced in the art 
market through the efforts of the gallery of our crews and so in instance crews uh, exhibited a uh, cruise gave space to artists from sri lanka vietnam australia the former yugoslavia and so on the owner of the gallery raymond cruz had a progressive agenda parts of the world artists who were known in paris at the time the Conang, in her own way took risks in in, in artists, uh, this is sorry, this is uh, Nena in the Havana, uh, in the Havana Biennale with uh, Arturo Luz, Anita Mangsay Salvo, uh, Vicente Manansala, H.R. Ocampo, including Fernando Sobel. So this was the uh, uh, 12 and represented the Philippines alongside Oscar Salameda. And this is the uh, Salon de l'Art Sacre et de Realité Spirituelle at the uh, Musée d'Art Modern in Paris in 1965. And some uh, photographs of her works at the uh, Library of the Pompidou and the works of, the, uh, of Nena in the French government collection. Uh, Nena was also in the uh, anthology of abstraction, global abstraction. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then we move on to criticism later. So Dukunang, Susan Dukunang, in her own way, took risks in artists who were not French and organized traveling exhibitions in places like Madrid, Stockholm, and Istanbul, in which uh, Nena Sagil participated. Uh, both Cruz and Dukunang took risks in exhibiting unknown artists. The second entry point is the expanding world of abstraction in the 60s in Paris, in which there was a drift towards a rethinking of the duality between reality and spirituality. So Sagil, as I showed earlier, took part in an exhibition presented by the Museum of Modern Art in Paris called the Salon de l'Art Sacre et de Realité Spirituelle. Sagil was also mentioned in a survey of global abstraction in 1974. Still part of a turning away from the empiricism of the object and the mystification of abstraction, a third moment might have been sought in the notion of the cybernetic, in which art and science, nature and artifice converge. Susanne de Conanc opened Centre d'Art Cybernetique in 1962. The Philippine critic uh, in Nidas Benesa's description of Sagil's work may give us a clue to the connection between a cybernetic consciousness and abstraction. Benesa wrote of Sagil's, and I quote him, new cosmos, a universe with its own laws of gravity and gravitation, suggestive of the inner fluxes and motions of the blood and the passage of wind and drain in the valleys and mountains of the unconscious as well as the outer fluxes with which we are all familiar, stream and river, moon, sun and planet, system and galaxy, end of quote. When a friend of Sagil, the Philippine artist Gaston Dama, provoked her by asking if she was painting like Sonia Delone, she responded quite sharply in the negative, saying that Delone's work is systematic while hers is sensible which may mean a work sensitive to the senses and to the natural world that is bodily sensed, an intuitive approach to a material world and inevitably an immaterial, an immaterial possibility. A German critic thinks that Sagil's points of departure, and I quote him, are the micro world of the nuclear cell, the breathing surface of the skin, the growing hair follicle, the color rich feather crown of the peacock or the artistic vein work of work. It has been claimed that, uh, end of quote, it has been claimed that the period of the 60s was fascinated with cybernetics. One of the artists who thought seriously about this was Roy Ascot, who exhibited with Sagil in Paris. According to Ascot, as feedback between persons increases and communications 
become more rapid and precise. So the creative process no longer culminates in the artwork, but extends beyond it deep into the life of each individual. Art is then determined not by the creativity of the artist alone, but by the creative behavior that his work induces in the spectator and in society at large. The art of our time tends towards the development of a cybernetic vision in which feedback, dialogue, and involvement in some creative interplay at deep levels of experience are paramount. The cybernetic spirit more than the method or the applied science creates a continuum of experience and knowledge which radically reshapes our philosophy, influences our behavior, uh, reshapes our philosophy, influences our behavior, and extends our thought, end of quote from Roy Ascot. In a way, the cybernetic may have grafted onto Zagil's investment in the non-objective, an intense refusal of objective reality and an exaltation of the spiritual, probably in the vein of Kandinsky, who inspired Zagil immensely. The third entry point is a critical reception on Sagil that allows us to suggest a comparative schema within which to situate her work. Ernest Frankel and Valdemar George co-wrote a short monograph on Sagil published by Edition Bon of Susan de Conang. Susan de Conang had a publishing arm that was connected to uh, her gallery, which makes her quite interesting as a gallerist at that time. It is important to closely read this criticism to find out how the European critics assess the work of Sagil in relation to their own art history and an incipient acknowledgement of a different expression of this art history from elsewhere. The prolific mono monographer, George, who was born in Poland, wrote on the decline of art from the West. And this impression might have provided him the conceptual space to be concerned about Sagil. The fourth entry point is the identification of, of, uh, of Sagil as a Filipino artist and by extension an Asian or Oriental. This made her intelligible as a representation of that identification and her participation in international art exhibitions that were put together according to the category of the national. This would include her exhibition at the UNESCO in Paris in 1985. When Suzanne de Conant wrote on Sagil for an exhibition she brought to Madrid, she referred to her in relation to migrant artists in Paris at that time, including the Armenian Hekiban, the Japanese Izumi, and the Chinese Tang. The final entry point is the subjectivity of a migrant woman artist in the 50s and 60s in Paris who lived alone and cultivated an artistic practice intertwined with a nearly ascetic life. It might have been that Sagil was released by Paris into another territory or that the city and its art world provided her the space to more fully experience and experiment with the world as an expatriate, which is another trace of the extraterritorial. When a friend asked her if she wanted to return to Manila, she answered that Manila's art scene was male dominated. In Paris, she was relatively unconstrained by the hierarchies of the homeland and pursued her path as an artist. Sagil's restless imagination found its universe in Paris, according to the art critic Emmanuel Torres, uh, and I quote him, incorporating found objects like shells, coffee grains, tin foil, other bits of applique for texture, making the paintings four square format by shaping canvas and drawing paper into irregular contours, painting on a canvas in the form of a diamond, tondo or ovalo, punching a hole or holes into the canvas surface. And as the interviewers of Sagil would point out, she painted everything in her small apartment, from the placemats to the refrigerator to the cabinets and so on and so forth. So it was some kind of an installation or a universe of its own. In relation to Sagil's struggle to practice in Paris, we might acknowledge as well the work of Sagil's gallerist, Susanne de Conan, who asserted her own presence in the Parisian art world in the 60s. 
She did not only exhibit Sagil in Paris and other countries, she also wrote on her work. This testifies to the solidarity of women artistic workers in Paris at that time. When asked about style, Sagil responded, style, what is it? I wish to make it clear if I paint, I do in my own way, in the spirit and the sentiment of, of the present, which is, I think, a sharp definition of the contemporary, the spirit and the sentiment of the present. This research, research takes inspiration from the way she summons the word spirit and sentiment and situates them in relation to the term present. On the one hand, the notion of the present speaks to the condition of an immediate, possibly urgent artistic climate. On the other, the imagination of spirit and sentiment could flex such urgency with spirit, something that is non-objective and extraterritorial, difficult to instrumentalize in terms of image or objecthood or even identity. When I read the criticism on Sagil by European critics, they seem to be reluctant to confine her to a particular style, to a set of art world or art historical conventions like surrealism or even art. In it seems that Sagil's art pressures the critic not to preempt the expression with the norms of style, to catch in the words of Max Ernst to Valdemar George, the tenuous shadow of a swallow in flight. So I end with this um, handwritten lecture of, of, of Sagil of the coming world of art. It's, uh, I found this from a friend of Nena, of um, a bunch of manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts on, uh, on, on, the visual arts and also on, on cinema. Sure how Nena would use these lectures or where she would lecture. But it's interesting to note as I end this lecture that Nena also annotated art history and was interested to uh, share her knowledge to of, of artists. So thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for uh, highlighting these uh, impulses uh, of Nena's uh, practice and life in Paris. Um, and I think uh, this is a really interesting um, kind of relay uh, of conversation um, that have been you know, uh, unfolding uh, since last week. Uh, with uh, interviewing the interviewers. Um, and I think this is a, a really interesting uh, opportunity to kind of deepen some, some of the questions, I think. And um, I, I think I just wanted to, um, to pick up on, on the immediate um, note uh, that you made uh, in relation to uh, annotating art history. Uh, Nena Sagil as uh, a migrant artist or as, a, as an artist at the time annotating art history. And I don't have very specific questions right now, but I think uh, I'm, I'm inviting you to speculate on some possibilities based on these um, impulses. And I wanted to, to open up a question regarding um, aesthetic experience. Um, is, is there a place to talk about extra aesthetic experience as a kind of methodology in, in annotating stable disciplines such as art history and how does, you know, um, a figure like Nena um, uh, employ this, this uh, promotion of aesthetic experience? Yeah, that's a good question. The annotation of art history, um, uh, might have taken you, you we can see in some of the manuscripts I think it's either she paraphrased some items in existing publications or she reinterpreted them so it's still difficult how those texts were produced no? so I mean uh, we can do research on 
on that. But uh, surely there was a conversation between her and 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 those texts, no? whether a paraphrased, copied entirely, or reinterpreted. But even then, she uh, wrote them again. I mean, literally, uh, in shorthand. So I mean that, in a way that you know, graphic gesture is uh, interesting on its own. There was there's all there also. Uh, like uh, ephemeral material on which uh, she wrote some comments. These are from brochures or like handouts from museums. And I also, some, I also saw some of them that she, she did that. I don't know what was the impulse exactly. It, may, it might have been that she was uh, educating herself. Uh, uh, in in Paris, uh, not by being in a classroom and listening to a lecture from a professor, but uh, uh, writing something after viewing something. Uh, so uh, the text might have been produced after an experience of the art. No, uh, so this was a way to. I don't know, maybe formalize or consolidate ideas uh, from experience. No? So that, that might be one possibility. The other possibility is that she wanted to self-historicize. She wanted to self-historicize. Uh, I noticed that uh, Nena uh, also did longhand uh, renderings of her uh, curriculum vitae. No? So she dutifully, diligently listed down uh, uh, her exhibitions, the texts written on her, and all the details like where the pieces went, which collection collected her work, uh, where she studied, and so on and so forth. So. I think that is also an interesting document, no? uh, uh, something that not so many artists would do uh, to write, you know, in, in longhand uh, uh, events or details of, of their practice. So uh, that might be a methodology of, of Nena no? to, to self-historicize and also to self-educate no, but not independent of the practice of making art and not also independent of the aesthetic experience uh, because they were like, uh, <clears throat> they were intertwined, the, the thinking and the feeling and then the doing and the historicizing. So that, that, that might be interesting to pursue. Yeah, and then I think, um, uh, you really touch on on this kind of uh, notion of almost you know um, retraining the hand, retraining the body, retraining uh, uh, emotions and and memory, which is uh, always associated perhaps with say uh, a migrant subjectivity, uh, this kind mm -hmm. of training and this kind of diligence. Um, and and I remember in in the conversation that you had with the. Uh, uh, Nena Sagal's interviewers, um, you ask questions about uh, gender, um, nationality, citizenship. Um, and then um, I, I also ask um, this question of aesthetic experience because um, I think there's always that kind of conversation around um, extraterritorial artists or uh, artists uh, living elsewhere. Um, which they are associated with the notion of being uh, apolitical, you know, um, the, the notion of not political as as uh, as w in in very specific political programs or definitions, um, and I wonder about um, the not the political subjectivity of Nena, but uh, perhaps 
how um, how images or or pictures uh, perhaps were the kind of you know refuge or maybe a new scene of uh, political imagination. Um, could we consider that? Or what are your thoughts about um, you know the image, extraterritorial image or extraterritorial picture? Um, by an artist as a possible scene for um, quote unquote political subjectivity. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Mm. That's, a, that's an interesting question. And uh, a possible way to answer is to return to the non objective, to the non objective as, a, uh, as perhaps a foil to realism that you know usually becomes instrumentalized by either identity or ideology whether from the left or the right no so so there was also there yeah it's also a turning away from empiricism which some southeast asian artists have perceived to be part of a Western metaphysics. No? So because of that, they would be drawn to other sources of feeling and thinking. Uh, that's why like mysticism or, uh, or, and then maybe later in some, in some practices, a bit of the shamanic, uh, or a more ritualistic kind of, uh, you know, world making uh, would be would be proposed. Anyway, anything that would turn away from the objective, no, uh, would I think open up a different uh, space for the imagination or for practice, or even like just initially a critique. Initially, a critique of the norms that have been uh, set into stone by the 19th century academy and then later by modernism. No? So the, the, the non-objective could be one, could be one uh, node. The other node might be uh, abstraction. Abstraction in the I think broadly conceived, no? it was, uh, could be an abstraction that, uh, uh, well, came from the non-objective, but also might have come from uh, this idea of the spiritual. And Kandinsky becomes a vital, like a cipher no? to, 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 to look into as well as those uh, ideas that uh, influenced someone like Hilary Bay, no? who founded this uh, or organized this museum of uh, uh, non-objective painting and the exhibition, The World of Tomorrow, The Art of Tomorrow. No? So ideas from, let us say, Rudolf Steiner or theosophy no? might be, sources too uh, for some kind of um, political because it is a different space no i mean the idea of uh, the fact that it's different might already translate uh, in political terms at a at a certain level and then uh, finally uh, for for nena the political context might have something to do with um, an unarticulated uh, uh, maybe an articulated uh, sensibility of the woman uh, because if you look at work in Manila she was already beginning to rethink the imagination of the woman 
uh, one we can make that case now we can make that case that there was a like an incipient let us say even feminist especially in one work an incipient feminist uh, thinking now so how it translated into uh, the abstraction in Paris is another is another question. Now, it could be that, because if you look at French feminism, now, it also invested in a, in, a, in, a, in a new language that was not legible now, uh, within like a patriarchal, I mean, maybe, we can look we, we can look into that also this mm, the early efforts in manila to rethink gender roles and how those efforts uh, converse with a uh, a newfound freedom in abstraction as an embodied by an uh, by the practice no of 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 nena as when we try to tease out aspects we, we, it's hard to disentangle no? the, the, the practice, the migration, uh, the gender, and, and even certain idiosyncrasies of, of, the, of the person, like living alone, living in some kind of an attic, uh, uh, working with other women artists, uh, uh, who were part of the uh, uh, like this coterie of artists from a woman gallerist like Susan de Conang. So, so I'm actually very interested in Susan de Conang because of this the cybernet movement as, and as well as the ability to internationalize uh, her program in, in Paris as a gallerist and yeah so again, practice and solidarity might have been the, the conceptual space no? in relation to uh, the non-objective for Nena and the cybernetic for, for Susan de Kuna. Mm. Yeah, um, really, um, really interesting uh, notes that we can pursue, Patrick. Mm -hmm. And um, I think just on the note of um, language and this kind of formation of language uh, that might not be necessarily legible at the time. Um, and in connection to the earlier discussion about uh, self-historicization, um, I'm, I'm also curious about um, uh, Nena's um, practice perhaps on references. Uh, was there a self-referential aspect to it that comes with uh, self-historization or coming to terms with a new language because um, there, there's also that you know node on kind of uh, not necessarily detachment uh, but, but I wonder if, if um, she had also ventured into uh, the practice of uh, you know forming her own references or self what was self-referentiality for her uh, perhaps yeah. Wow, that's a <laughs> good question. No, um, the well, because the, the the works in Paris are mostly, of course, I think entirely abstraction. No, although I think she made some portraits too. And of those who knew her. But she would, you know, make small paintings as like presents when she would attend birthdays and so on and so forth. Uh, I think there was an emptying out of the self, so uh, which complicates the maybe the inclination to ask about self reflexivity or self-referentiality. So um, uh, I think when, when she, because there is this, like, I think it was Benesa who said that, or maybe Torres, maybe Benesa, 
like this search for the absolute or i think it was in the interview sorry in the interview with sid reyes no? the search for the absolute i don't know it would bear you know interrogation how that notion of the absolute or the mystical would accommodate the agency of the self no? would accommodate the agency of of the self it is the self who partly uh, renders that new world no? through practice and in fact almost in trance in obsession now i mean i mean with those like almost manic uh, uh, depiction of circles that go deeper and deeper now uh, yeah so how how that relates that intense now intense uh, like physicality or intense dedication of the human faculty how that how that uh, that how that might be seen in relation to also some kind of surrender no some kind of uh, abdication to something maybe higher greater yeah so maybe she was also struggling with 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 that no uh, that's why there was a uh, almost a what do you call this a denial of the worldly no as we hear in the interviews like i mean it was so telling when nick de uh was thinking because she would only see nena in a particular type i mean particular dress or a particular you know get up so she was he was wondering if this was all that she had no so uh, but so there was this like denial of the worldly but also a a sense of plenitude uh, density no within the room because everything was like painted almost colonized by the art or colonized the wrong word or or like inhabited inhabited by by but by, by the art but when you open the refrigerator there's only one egg you know <laughs> yeah so but there's was all over abstraction in the in the art world scene so yeah uh, I'm, I do not like to present that as a dichotomy because that we might lapse into a, you know, a system of thought that doesn't do justice to the complexity of Nena's struggle with this, uh, with this world things, I think. Yeah, I don't know if I answered you, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also thinking about it. Yeah, this, uh, this interplay, you know? of the a certain worldliness and then or other this ability to conceive worlds no? or a world beyond the current world and also a desire to be like immaterial or to to disavow uh, worldliness but 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 uh, um, uh, Nick was saying, right? She was there alone, but she was. Did she didn't? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, she didn't uh, disavow the world. She would go. I mean, to the library every day and to read and so on and so forth. So I think, yeah, mm, there must be another language to 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 render that uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. I think the I think the last um, bit that you mentioned about uh, Leonard should really um, you know incorporate a lot of you know uh, thinking not just around Nena, I guess, but um, the the long history of you know articulating extraterritorial lives or extraterritorial subjectivities uh, have always been kind of described as you know uh, chronologically anonymous and and in the case of nena we we see and and as 
uh, presented, uh, this was not necessarily the case. You know, it might be other worlds that, you know, render her as chronologically anonymous, uh, but was very present and this kind of, um, and it really reminds me of, you know, uh, the, the discussions around, you know, um, um, the plenitude in terms of bodies, you know, the bodies of God, you know, uh, we're, we're celebrating the Holy Week. So this kind of um, ascetic and, you know, deem bodies in relation to that. Um, but also in, within the discussion of artistic practice, uh, art history, and um, um, pictures, images. Um, and I think that's, that's a very um, uh, generative uh, closing for this um, series of uh, public program uh, that we've been doing for a month. <laughs> Thank you so much um, on external reality. Um, and I think on, on that note, maybe I can add that uh, Nena Sagil was a good friend of David Medalia. Mm -hmm. So uh, that could also be an interesting uh, entry point, not the, the work of David in relation to, to, to Nena. I remember David saying that I'm not an exile because she, he has always been uh, like... Uh, pictured no as a migrant exile said i'm not exile i'm not an exile or an expatriate or or, or a migrant i'm a uh, i'm at home uh, anywhere in the world like clouds no and this is in reference to to his uh, cloud canyons uh, bubble machine so i think that that delicacy of uh, of uh, Maybe these circles or this vein work in re I mean this delicacy of the bubble, no, that the, that membrane that bursts quickly, no? but at the same time uh, continuously is continuously produced. So I think that might be the language that uh, could could give us uh, a a better way to a more complex way to understand no? how like Nena and David uh, thought about their place in the world and the world that they might have been also uh, 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 anticipating. Mm -hmm. no? uh, yeah, so it's a look at the, the bubble machine, the bubbles of David in relation to uh, Nena's, uh, you know, cosmic... Uh, Landscape. Yeah, cosmic landscapes, no? They, yeah, so I think, uh, and both are, you know, both, I mean, these images are rooted very, like, very well historicized. I mean, where, for instance, the, the inspiration of the bubble is well historicized by, by David. And then these uh, cosmic landscapes are, are all rooted in the practice of of, of, of Nena, no? So we, we think, yeah, that, that might be the, the place to begin. True. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think it corresponds very well with what you said about uh, surrender uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, surrender without this avowal of uh, the world, mm -hmm. you know, because of this, both of them have this kind of commitment to uh, uh, the primacy of the, the optical. I mean, the, the first uh, uh, approach to, to their artworks, you know, it really captivates, you know, your optical uh, yeah. uh, senses. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, um, thank you so much, Patrick. And, pleasure, yeah. And uh, congratulations on this uh, series of talks, yeah, with different uh, perspectives and voices. Yeah. Yes, from tuberculosis to Nana Sagil. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Thank you so much.